of petitioners, and I'm going to give you an opportunity to introduce yourselves in due course. Um, tell us who you are, and also in due course, I'll give the ambassador and her delegation an opportunity uh, to respond. The petitioners have indicated um, that this hearing will provide us with information on the situation of indigenous peoples who live in the village of Apatina, the Wayana communities, as well as the no contact people living traditional lives in the forested regions of the southeast of Suriname. Um, we welcome your presence here today. Uh, we look forward to hearing from you, the petitioners, and also to the state's response. I have with me this afternoon uh, the first vice president of the commission, Commissioner Rosemary Antoine, who is also the commissioner with responsibility for the rights of indigenous peoples. Also present is Commissioner James Cavallaro and the deputy executive secretary, Elizabeth Abbey Merced. Um, I am the commissioner with responsibility for Suriname. Can I hand over to you, petitioners? I want to thank um, the commissioners for hearing us. Thank you very much for this opportunity to speak with you. And I want to also greet the state. Thank you for being here also. I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Sarah Augustine. I'm the co-director of the Suriname Indigenous Health Fund. Um, I'm here representing the Wayana people, as demonstrated by the letter of request that we have submitted to the commission on behalf, on behalf of Abtuk Nuwahe, the Grandman and the traditional leader of the Wayana, who has requested our assistance in approaching the commission. Uh, the Wayana inhabit the Lawa, Latani, Olamari, and Upper Tam Tapanahoni watersheds. And today we'll speak specifically about the community of Apatina, which is on the Tapanahoni River. On behalf of the Wayana, we have requests of the commission. Specifically, we would ask that you would review the recommendations that we made in our request and follow up on them with the state of Suriname. Also, we request that you will conduct an on-site visit to the interior region of Suriname, specifically to the community of Apatina, and to file a report on your findings and to make recommendations based on your individual experience um, on that site vi visit. In our request, uh, we had seven points, um, uh, specifically the adverse impacts and exclusion from development uh, projects on the Wayana. Number two is the health effects specifically of mercury contamination associated with dumping of waste. Um, number three is a lack of education, access to education. Number four is food insecurity. Number five is land rights. Number six, cultural extermination, and number seven, government censorship. Um, because you have already uh, reviewed, I'm sure, our request, I'm going to focus specifically on items uh, one, two, four, and seven. Uh, we don't wish to minimize the other issues, um, but these are the ones that we will emphasize in this hearing. So I'll begin with the adverse impacts and exclusion from development projects. Development taking place in the interior region of Suriname leads to indirect forced relocation, environmental degradation, the deterioration of community health, um, and indigenous peoples who are forced to relocate to the urban area, specifically the Wayana, um, are worse off in terms of access to livelihood, health, and education than they were living their traditional lifestyle. We have observed this process um, in the IADB project, the Inter-American Development Bank project, the Suriname Land Management Pro Project, where the bank provided legislation and capital with an aim to, quote, uh, provide a final solution to land disputes in the interior rainforest region, where gold and timber resources are concentrated and replace traditional land tenure systems with an active market system. We documented this process by invoking the independent consultation and inve investigation mechanism of the IDB, the Inter-American Development Bank. Our recommendation specifically, we encourage the commission to explore the possibility of engaging financial structures such as the IADB in dialogue and further to explore the jurisdiction of the commission in approaching the financial structures including the IADB. I would like to mention the American Convention on Human Rights Pact of San Jose, Chapter 3, Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights, also Article 26. Um, our next point is on the health effects of mercury contamination associated with dumping mine waste. 
Mercury bioaccumulates in fish, which is the primary source of protein. We've demonstrated in the risk assessment that we've submitted to the commission, which was published in 2012. This research demonstrates um, the risk that is imposed on the community of Apatina as a result from having a con contaminated food supply. Uh, we demonstrated neurological impact, impact, including a surge in birth defects, sickness, disability, and premature death in our health assessment, which we've also um, submitted to the commission. Uh, that was rooted for peer review in 2013. We've noted that bacteria in E. coli uh, is in the water from high concentrations of itinerant gold miners, um, and uh, those gold miners are operating with inadequate sanitation. So they're polluting the sole water supply for the, for the Wayana people. This is particularly important for children under age five who are um, impacted by diarrhea and um, dehydration. The impact of mercury is also specifically harsh on the youngest and most vulnerable population. Um, women who are pregnant are most severely impacted by mercury intoxication as well as children under five, those people whose nervous systems are still developing. We have also demonstrated in our health assessments that all individuals, individuals of all ages are actually impacted by mercury contamination from this waste, just um, inadequate dumping of toxic waste. We understand from the testimony of our in-country partners that concession owners uh, willingly and knowingly support small-scale gold mining. And this is important to note because often in the news you will hear that um, these are illegal miners that come into uh, Suriname lands and there's no way to control that. Um, but actually we are told that those people who control concessions in the interior uh, are benefiting from that gold mining and are in partnership with these itinerant miners who come in and do this alluvial gold mining. Um, so we. Uh, would like to um, ask the commission to encourage the state to regulate the gold mining industry and prohibit mercury pollution. We also urge the commission to uh, follow up with the state to enact measures to clean up waterways affected by mercury runoff. I would like to mention the Convention on the Elimination of Forms of Racism and Discrimination, specifically Article 5E4, which guarantees all citizens the right to public health, medical care, social security, and social services. I would also like to mention the Convention on the Rights of the Child, specifically Article 24, which states that all children have the right to the highest attainable standard of health. Um, this is a very important and pressing need among the Wayana people, and I urge you to take it seriously because um, it not only impedes the success of this community, it also impedes the overall ability for these people, the Wayana people, which are vulnerable, pe vulnerable people, to live at all. And I'm here to urge you to protect their right to exist. I would next like to talk about food insecurity, which is point number four on our request. The traditional livelihood activities of the Wayana are hunting, fishing, gathering, subsistence agriculture. This is all disrupted by mining and by relocation schemes leading to population concentrations that exceed the carrying capacity of the rainforest. So in the 90s, indigenous people were consolidated into large areas and um, that has put a strain on the ecosystem that surrounds them in the large village structure. As I said before, E. coli from itinerant miners has contaminated the water. There is essentially no available source of clean water in the Wayana community. And um, the fish, which is the primary food supply, and access to protein of the Wayana is contaminated by mercury. So there, there is effectively no way for them to, um, to, to have a, a supply of protein that's healthful. Um, some have tried to go in and instruct the people to eat uh, fish that are lower on the trophic level who may have less mercury uh, to uh, curtail the bioaccumulation. But what we have heard from the Wayana is we, we, we eat what the forest gives us and we are dependent on the fish that come to us. So um, that, that is the situation that they face. I would like to take the opportunity to ask the state specifically to compromise themselves before the commission and make a commitment to provide clean water and food to the community. We ask for immediate relief, actually, and I hope you will respond to that because um, without that commitment, uh, we are not clear how long Apatina will be able to continue to exist. 
I would like to mention the American Convention on Human Rights, the Pact of San Jose, Chapter 3, Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights, and Article 12, the right to food. Finally, I would like to talk about item number seven in our request, which is government censorship. We've had a consistent um, issue of intimidation of in-country partners operating in the capital, those who have been assisting us in the work that we've been doing since um, 2004. Um, this intimidation includes breaking into homes, stealing computers, putting pressure and intimidation and threatening reprisal against those who will work with us. Those repri reprisals have to do with both employment and the threat of um, physical unsafety. I also would like th to note the intimidation, the consistent Im intimidation of Suriname Indigenous Health Fund staff, including myself and Daniel Peplo, my co-director, including a threatening email from an individual that was named in the request that we made to this commission. So we have received um, an intimidating email since we filed our request to the commission, which I assume you submitted to the state, and we have received other threats since then, um, which implies that the state has shared our request with the individual who named specific aspects of the request we filed with you. At this point, our communication with the Wayana is severely strained because um, our ability to move about safely in Suriname um, is at risk, and for that reason, we have filed a precautionary measure with the Commission requesting intervention to protect our right to defend the rights of the Wayana. This is very important for us, and I ask for you to urgently um, consider our, our request for precautionary principle. We also have the int intention of filing a second precautionary principle to ensure the food security of the Wayana people themselves. I would like to mention the American Convention on Human Rights, the Pact of San Jose, Chapter 3, Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights, Article 14, the rights to the benefit of, <clears throat> of culture, and also Article 25 of the Rules of Procedure of the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights. My concluding remarks, I just want to um, ask you and plead with you to consider um, the recommendations that we've made in our request to advocate for the survival of the Wayana people. Thank you. I want to introduce to you the others that are on my delegation. Um, Doug Hostetter will present to you next a photo essay that he has um, created from his time on the human rights delegation in 2011 when he accompanied Suriname Indigenous Health Fund to the interior of Suriname. He is the director of the Mennonite Central Committee, United Nations Office. Thank you very much. Uh, I want to thank the Commission for meeting with us, and I want to thank uh, Suriname for coming to uh, uh, hear our testimony today. And I want to thank you for the warm hospitality which your citizens gave me when I traveled there three years ago. Uh, not only the Wayana people, but also all of the citizens of Suriname that I met with uh, treated us most graciously and war welcomed us most warmly, and I thank you. I come representing the Mennonite Central Committee. Uh, the Mennonite Central Committee is the relief, service, and peace organization of the Mennonite and Brethren in Christ churches in North America. We have about 1,000 staff, and we work in about 60 countries around the world. For those of you who are not familiar with Mennonites, um, Mennonites are a peace church. Um, I come from a long line of Mennonite ministers and bishops. And I think I can safely say that my ancestry has not participated in killing another human being in the last 500 years. Mennonites believe in using the power of love and truth to deal with injustice and to restore the dignities to people in the areas where we work. I was invited to participate with the Suriname Indigenous Health Fund in their trip two years ago to help uh, to photograph and document our experience with the Wayana people. And I would like to just walk you through the photo essay. I hope you will feel and get to know the uh, people of uh, the Wayana people through this experience so that it is not just an intellectual, but it is also an emotional establishment. We started actually uh, much closer to the capital visiting a maroon village, uh, formerly with uh, two to 300 people on the banks of the Saramac River, um, which 
uh, two years earlier had two to 300 people. When we came there, the village was almost entirely abandoned. There were, in fact, were only two remaining uh, people living in the village when we went through there. They have the misfortune of being downriver from a major uh, uh, gold mining um, uh, processing plant further up the river. After that, we went to Apatina, um, a Wayana village on the Tapahone River. Uh, move on a little further. Okay, somehow or other we've, we've gotten, um, <laughs> slide it over. Okay, that's a good uh, picture of that. Um, the uh, Wayana people have been living for more than a, a millennium on these rivers. They get their water, their food, uh, and uh, use for drinking and um, washing, uh, cleansing themselves, doing their wash uh, in those areas. Unfortunately, because of um, gold mining up the river, much of it uh, done on an artisanal level. Uh, there are serious mercury levels within the river which exceeds U.S. government standards. I wanted to show you pictures of several of the people that I met while I was there. Um, Magwali Ajika, who is holding his um, three-year-old son uh, who cannot walk and is weak and often has a fever his father suspects mercury poisoning. Okawali uh, Paweke, <laughs> um, who doesn't know his age, um, for 10 years now he has been able to, unable to walk and lost most of his memory, his handshake. The doctors feel that it is because uh, of mercury poisoning. I uh, wanted to introduce you to a, that's him there. Wanted to use, introduce you to a young mother um, whose uh, first child, Nali, died in, 19, uh, in 2007 at the age of two months. She was badly deformed at birth and was buried underneath her mother's hammock in her house. The um, Wayana village uh, in uh, Apakina in the Lawe River can only um, uh, survives largely on the fish that the men uh, are able to uh, gather out of the uh, Lawa River there. Uh, they have been told they're only to eat the small fish, but the women told us essentially because of survival you have to eat more or less whatever your husband can bring in. Um, the United Nations Declarations on the Right of Indigenous Peoples recognizes indigenous peoples' rights to own and develop and control their own land and requires the state to give legal recognition and protection to those lands within their land tenure system. Um, I want to appeal to you as people and as a commission to recognize that these people have lived on these rivers for a millennium. There, in one generation, a mining of gold has poisoned and polluted the rivers and destroyed their ability to earn uh, to be able to survive on their, those rivers. I hope that you act before it is too late. I thank you. I would like to um, introduce the last person on our delegation. <clears throat> this is Mark McDonald. He's the North American Regional President of the World Council of Churches and the National Indigenous Anglican Bishop of Canada. Thank you very much. Um, I'm happy to be here to represent the uh, concern and community of a number of uh, global Christian commu communities, uh, specifically about the intersection of indigenous rights and the environment, and uh, with, particularly with the Wayana people. I think that the, their case uh, represents an urgent example of something that we see as a, a, a growing global concern and certainly our churches are becoming more and more aware of. That is, again, the intersection of indigenous rights and 
and the environment. We see with the Wayano, like indigenous people around the globe, a living connection between the environment and their lifestyle. And uh, we see the environmental degradation that surrounds them and as well as uh, the action of, of uh, uh, many other uh, actors in, 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 in their area as threatening that connection. Now, we believe that this is, is a critical and important uh, uh, concern in and of itself, but we're acutely and painfully aware that much of society does not, is, does not seem to have the capacity to understand this concern. And, and we, we feel that it is because for many people living in the world today, they have lost a sense of that living connection between the land and, and, and life. Because of that loss of connection, we see this not only as, as a matter of concern for an oppressed people, which uh, is, is certainly uh, compelling in and of itself, but we believe that this uh, has the seeds in it of a larger issue that needs to be addressed by, by, by the nations. Thank you. Thank you very much to the petitioners. Uh, I wanted to <coughs> invite the ambassador uh, and her delegation to respond. Ambassador. Thank you, Madam President, um, for inviting uh, the state um, also to this hearing and to um, listen to the various arguments that have been put forward by the petitioners. Um, we would like to recognize the letter that has been sent to us regarding um, the request for a written response from the government of Suriname. Um, but due to the fact that it was received quite late and we were not able to uh, send in a written response before this hearing, we would like to um, assure the Commission that um, within due course we will you can uh, receive an all-encompassing report with um, uh, respect to the various points that have been raised uh, in writing by the petitioners. Um, I would like to um, introduce to you um, the members of the delegation of Suriname. Um, on my uh, left-hand side, uh, I have the Presidential Commissioner for Land Rights, um, Mr. Missy Jan. Um, who has been uh, appointed by the president to deal with the matters of uh, land rights and uh, cause for, um, um, the cause for the well-being of the indigenous and the tribal communities in Suriname. Next to him, you will f we have uh, the district's commissioner for the district of Tapanahoni. Uh, it is the district where the Apetina um, um, community lives. Um, we have um, our human toxicologist, Dr. Dacom, next to him, and he will also respond to some of the uh, very important uh, elements that have been raised by the petitioners. And um, at the far end of the table, we have Ms. Um, uh, Josef Soon, who is, who is a lawyer to the Bureau of the Land Rights Commission. Um, I'm the ambassador of Suriname. The petitioners might not know me, but the permanent representative of Suriname to the OAS. And next to me, I have the first secretary to my mission, uh, Ms. Alson Hout. I would like to use the opportunity to ask uh, the presidential commission to respond to the um, issues that have been put forward by the petitioner. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mrs. Ambassador. Thank you, uh, uh, Mrs. Uh, President. I have listened very carefully to, to the statement of, of the petitioners, which express so much love from their side to, to the indigenous communities. And in that sense, I'm asking myself why no member of the Apetina community is here present today with them. Because if you love those indigenous people so much, then I would like to see one of them here. It's important to know that. 
Mrs. President, in, uh, apart from the information, the statement uh, the petitioner just made, we've looked at their written documentation, the documentation, the documents that's provided by the Suriname Indigenous Health Fund. And uh, we can conclude that the information is outdated, inaccurate, and rather subjective. Since the appointment of the current government in 2010, several activities and concrete measures have been undertaken. In this context, it is worthwhile mentioning that with regard to small-scale mining activities, the restructuring and modernization throughout the gold mining sector is a top priority for the current government of Suriname. In order to achieve this, the Commission Regulation Gold Sector was installed in November 2010. The regulation of the gold sector has multiple objectives, but the overall goal is to return illegal, informal activities and situations into the legal sphere. This means that the following conditions need to be achieved. Rehabilitation of the government authority and supervision, safety and security of the citizens and communities, efficiency in gold mining activities by means of sustain sustainable extraction and production, and environmental protection. Within this initiative, a process was initiated to train small-scale gold miners on location about the importance of mercury-free and gold mining and introduce them to new methods in this regard. Mining surface centers have been established in various areas such as Anapaike, which is also a Wayana community. Those centers serve as one-stop windows for small-scale miners regarding various aspects of their, to their activities. When we look at the socio-economic socio and governance conditions, which also have been brought, uh, brought on table by uh, the petitioner. With respect to the allegation that the Wayana people are facing threats due to the social, social economic and governance conditions that are generated by development practices, the government wishes to underscore the following. The government of Suriname recognized that all of its citizens are equal before law and that no one shall be discriminated against. Henceforth, the principles of equality and non-discrimination are enshrined in the Constitution of the Republic of Suriname. Article 8, paragraph 1 and 2 stipulates that all who are within the territory of Suriname shall have an equal claim to protection of person and property and that no one shall be discriminated against on the grounds of birth, sex, race, language, religious origin, education, political beliefs, economic positions, or any other status. The social and economic objectives of the government of Suriname are a reflection of the stipulations regarding the, the economic system of Suriname and are aimed at the construction of a national economy for the benefit of the entire nation in which everyone shares equally in the economic, social, and cultural development and progress. This applies also on the Wayana people. The national legislations and concurrent public policies are therefore geared towards the promotion of socio-economic development and a socially just society for all without any distinction. Consequently, the principle of equality enshrined in the Constitution 
of the Republic of Suriname should not be equated with assimilation, nor should it in any way be perceived as discriminatory to persons or groups. In relation to certain entitlements pertaining to the rights of indigenous and tribal communities, it is of relevance to refer to the adherence of the government to existence traditional structures of decision-making and consultation procedures, mechanisms, and instruments between the government and indigenous and tribal communities and or tribal leaders. These are observed in the guise of bringing about just and equal social economic development of the entire population and the country as well. One of the key elements of the government policy in re with regard to education is that of equality, namely equality of education in the interior, whereas in as well as in the coastal plains. To guarantee equal, equal quality of education, there is no difference in the curricula of students in the interior with those in the plain, coastal plains. On a, regular, on a regular basis, field visits are conducted by education inspectors to guarantee the quality of education. In addition, the government has prepared extra training for teachers in the interior and efforts are undertaken to encourage teachers to educate in the interior. The institution responsible for educational inspection is tasked with furthering the tools to help both teachers and students. As regards the Apatina area, the government has restarted a school in Apatina, the school in Apatina in 2007 with training a crops of teachers and setting up a new school. The current, the current ele elementary school has been operational for seven years and has delivered a graduation rate in 2013 that is comparable with other schools in the country. Approximately 100 children attend the school at Apatina. Speaking of, speaking of health, health facilities, there is a medical mission clinic presently in the community of Apatina, and this clinic takes care of primary health care according to primary health care principles. Programs are executed in accord accordance with national guidelines of the Ministry of Public Health within the care provision of the medical mission. There is also a traditional medical clinic that offers the possibility for training. The Amazon Conservation, Conservation Team manages its own building that offer employment to seven persons. The government has worked together with the Emerson Conservation Team to revive transfer of knowledge of medical plants and traditional healing practices still present among shamans and elders by establishing a traditional health clinic in 2015. 2005. Sorry, this clinic works together with a medical mission in providing health care and in Apetina. <clears throat> with respect to land rights, Mrs. President, I would like to to put the emphasis on the activities that the Surinamese government is currently undertaken together with indigenous communities and maroon communities. Currently, we are in a process 
where the government the government is undertaking certain activities to be mentioned. We are now in a process of drafting a law on traditional authorities, which also will apply on the indigenous communities of Apetina. We are in the process of cons consulting all the indigenous communities. However, we haven't we, 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 we haven't gone to the Apetina area yet, but it's also on, on the agenda. And we hope that this, this path that has been agreed upon by the indigenous communities and the Maroon communities and the government of Suriname will finally result in in solving the land rights issue. One of the issues that we have also under consideration is the issue of free prior and informed consent. That issue we have also agreed upon with the Maroons and the indigenous communities to elaborate on that issue, to work it out so that we can have a, a clear view on what it really means to the indigenous community, but also what it means to the Maroon communities and the government. Mrs. President, finally, with regard to the allegation related to, the, related to government censorship, it should be noted that the government of Suriname doesn't prevent nor restricts any organization to work in Suriname. It's important to know that. The government of Suriname doesn't prevent nor restricts any organization to work in Suriname. As a matter of fact, several non-governmental organizations are operational in Suriname. However, it should be noted that these organizations are also subjected to the rules and procedures of the country. If it regards NGOs being involved in research involving human participants, it is, for example, required that the approval of the National Committee on Scientific Research involving human subjects of the Ministry of Health in Suriname is sought. Referring to the report of SIHF of 17 March 2014 to the Rapporteur on Human Rights Defenders, which states that since 2004, Apetina, they have performed community-directed risk and health assessment studies, the approval of the ethical committee has never been sought. I want to repeat this. The approval of the ethical committee has never been sought. Especially research in a different country and within a different cultural setting within the country requires extra scrutiny for approval from the local research ethical committee and IRB from sponsoring institution when applicable. There is much more to agree on than in a study in a developed country. And finally, uh, cultural as regard the aspects of cultural extermination as brought forward by the petitioner. Uh, I want to be very clear that uh, the, Suriname, the Surinamese government, the state of Suriname, does not in any manner infringe on the free enjoyment of culture of citizens and also doesn't promote activities that could infringe on this fundamental right. On the contrary, the government respects and promotes 
the rich cultural diversity by means of policy. This right is anchored in Article 18 of the Vietnamese Constitution. Mrs. President, uh, with your permission, I would ask Mr. Uh, Mr. Decom, who is a doctor. Oh, okay. 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 To elaborate further on. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I'd like to a little bit further refer to the uh, issue of uh, ethical research, of the ethics of research, uh, refer to the earlier made statement. Uh, the description that is used in the Human Subject Review section of the submitted manuscript for publication in the Pan American Journal of Public Health is very blurry and confusing. Um, not seeking approval of the Ethical Commission before executing research affects the overall credibility of the research that uh, is supposed to be published. From the external researcher involved in the research effort and aware of the need for an IRB review, it might be expected that in collaboration with its local counterparts, local approval is sought. If this is overlooked by the local counterparts, it is in fact a moral research plight and reprehensible, if not done, to inform them of the common practice to submit a research proposal for review and approval to a research ethical committee. Um, the absence of approval from the National Ethical Committee is not an incident on its own. We like to point out two other publications where no approval was sought. It's a publication in the Pan American Journal of Public Health on community re directed research assessment of mercury exposure from Golden Suriname and community led assessment of risk from exposure to mercury by Native American Indian Rihanna in Southeast Suriname in the Journal of Environment and Public Health. On the perf uh, performed research itself, <clears throat> The statement of SEHF, uh, quote, in Apatina we have performed community directed risk and health assessment studies since 2004. These studies, which combine clinical examination and scoring of individuals, perform a score on a battery of neurological tests in conjunction with the hair mercury data, have conclusively shown neurological dysfunction consistent with mercury poisoning among residents in Apatina. The wording conclusive is not sustained by the research articles used for the statement. And then I refer to the article in the Journal of Environment and Public Health and a manuscript that is submitted uh, to the Journal of Public Health from the Pan American Health Organization. And I'd like to point out some more details from this manuscript. Uh, the introduction of this research is, uh, in general, there are ref reference missing for guidance uh, mentioned or de definitions used, so the judgment is difficult to make. The hypothesis of the research is not clearly defined, and it's part of, this, uh, of, the, of the discussion that should be uh, in the article. Uh, the team composition for the health assessment team, it's not clearly defined what the individual's roles are. Uh, there's also a sustainable selection bias introduced in the study with the participant selection, and it's questionable if there is a reliable testing of the earlier mentioned hypothesis. And I'd like to quote, that in this manuscript it stated that the participants were pre-selected based upon the 2008 risk assessment by villagers for community members who exhibit neurological deficits such as ataxia, tremor, or other movement disorders. The mentioned reference of the 2008 risk assessment is not clear if, it's the re if it refers to the early mentioned article in the Journal of Environment and Public Health. Um, and when it refers to this article, then a sustainable so, sorry, substantial selection bias is introduced into the study because there is stated in that article, the attending physician performed limited examinations on persons who requested a consultation because they thought they had been exposed to potentially hazardous level of mercury. Further selection was based on preferences of the village to include children and participants were selected with the highest previously measured hair mercury levels. Further, a flaw in the article is, of the manuscript of the article, is that the index of neurological integrity is modified from the original one without proper, proper augmentation, why it was done so. The screening examination which consists, consists of neurological, sorry, neuropsychological testing is not validated or is suit, suitably indicated for the Wayana population. There are no reference to compare this, this study with other studies. And it's not clear what the mentioned wording of directed screening medical exam consists of. And very, very important point is there are no exclusion criteria for the research as mentioned, such as severe neurological diseases such as Parkinson's, stroke, severe accident like brain injury, 
birth trauma, tetanus, polio, hypothyroidism, epilepsy, malaria, diabetes, or any other severe uh, disease, which may introduce too many factors that confound with metal mercury intoxication symptoms. An omission in the analysis for mercury in hair is that there are no occlusion, exclusion criteria or procedures mentioned to exclude external airborne contamination when measuring total mercury in hair. And the analytical procedure used is not commonly uh, used for mercury analysis and it is missing proper references to validate it. And it's common practice to analyze for metal mercury in hair the indicator for mercury exposure through fist consumption. Also, the statistical, statistical test used they are questionable because the study hypothesis is not very clear, so it's not clear what kind of statistical test has been used of, or, or if they are appropriate. And for the results, uh, for the results without proper exclusion criteria for the neuropsychological testing or proper defining the directed screening medical exam, the phrase, and I quote, based exclusively on medical examinations of subjects, the medical team diagnosed six subjects suggesting a tentative diagnosis of minimata disease. This is very suggestive reading and stigmatizing for the concerned subjects. The conclusion in the article based on the above cannot be cannot support, uh, sorry, the conclusion in the article based on the above cannot be supported and is incorrect. And I quote this study case study, this, sorry, this case study which combines clinical examination and scoring of individual performances score on a battery of neurological tests. In conjunction with the hair mercury data from the 2008 risk assessment and supplemented with additional exposure data in 2012, found neurological dysfunctions consistent with mercury poisoning among residents in uh, Apatina is not sustained by that. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, to both the petitioners and the state um, for your both information and the responses. Um, I wanted to, to give an opportunity to my fellow commissioners to, to offer their comments and observations. Um, I, I, I was actually hoping, Mr. Decom, that we might have heard if the state had conducted tests themselves and whether you actually had information and I, I noticed that you provided us an analysis of the, the study done by the petitioners, but I certainly would be very interested in whether the state has responded ultimately, and I'll give you a chance to, yes. to, um, to let us know if you have responded to the concerns of the community about their health and mercury poisoning and whether you have any information yourselves um, pursuant to the state's understanding of its responsibility to all citizens, the principles of equality and non-discrimination which you described, which would help us to understand the situation. Um, I think all of us who watched um, the, the photo essay noted um, specific allegations made by residents. Um, and I, I certainly would be interested in knowing how the state, um, what the state has learned through its own studies of the situation. Uh, I, I was interested in hearing from the petitioners um, the numbers of uh, the, your approximate numbers of members of the community in this area. Um, in some documentation, you, you mentioned no contact communities, and um, we'd welcome hearing a little bit more about um, what what we know about those communities where they are. Uh, I. Um, I also noted the, the mention of government censorship, but I wanted the petitioners to clarify what you meant because you also mentioned um, threatening correspondence from persons, but it wasn't clear whether those were state officials at all. Um, and I would just say in the context of these hearings, um, the commissions in its, it, commission in its rules makes it clear that there should be no reprisals for participation in these particular proceedings. Um, and we know the state will, will have full regard to that, but we're, we're interested in hearing from the state um, whether you have received these um, concerns and um, certainly if the, we, we can ensure that they are transmitted to you um, and ask the state to, to fully investigate and to offer adequate protection where it is needed. Um, I also wanted to make a, an observation because I did note the, the concern you had about the presence of indigenous persons here. Um, and it's actually 
very normal in hearings to have um, petitioners represent others. Um, that's, that's not unusual. Um, and the, the understanding I had from the petitioners was that you are here, or certainly at least one of you, um, on the instructions and with the authority of the communities involved. So I wouldn't w wish us to, to take what is said any less seriously um, because we don't have the presence of indigenous persons from the communities here um, today. Um, I'll hold for the moment, Commissioner. Antoine. Uh, thank you, and thank you to both of you for coming here today to help us really um, air these issues and to attempt to address some of them. I think the Commission has an important role to provide a forum for dialogue, and I hope that's the spirit in which um, we take this hearing. Um, I, too, hope that we can get to the bottom of what was raised about intimidation. Uh, as the Rapporteur of Indigenous persons, rights of indigenous persons. Um, I'm beginning to think I'm sounding a bit repetitive now because there's a transsectional issues that keep arising, which clearly are being raised here again in this hearing, which have to do with some core principles in relation to uh, the indigenous people's rights to consultation, um, the, the context of extractive industries and the impact, the negative impact uh, usually on the rights of indigenous peoples that they have fought long and hard for, right to self-determination, and rights to land, all of these keep coming up. Um, there was a visit by uh, the Rapporteur for Women, who is the chair here today, and my predecessor, Dinah Shelton, to Suriname, I believe it was last year. And um, some of these same issues were reported. Some findings were reported. They may be initial, but they do tend to give credibility that these are issues that need to be resolved or need to be taken seriously at any rate, um, and that was a local visit. Um, um, I wanted to mention, too, that the rapporteurship has now um, a, a report on peoples in isolation, which might be of interest and is being um, about to be launched. But there were two sorts of main headings apart from these general issues, and let me also mention racism, which comes into um, the, the, issue, the context as well. Um, there were two main issues apart from wanting generally to see some of the recommendations that my fellow commissioners made from that visit, I wanted them to see them implemented because concrete recommendations were made that I wanted to raise. One has to do with economic, social, and cultural rights, which I think is clearly contextualized here. It's an issue of increasing importance to the commission, particularly in the context of the San Salvador Protocol. We now have a unit. Uh, we are now looking at these um, rights as more justiciable and how to enhance um, them. We have adopted the principle of progressive realization of these rights. Nevertheless, uh, when it comes to health issues, we have a long tradition of viewing health in the context of the right to life, where health can be life-threatening, as it clearly can be um, in, in terms of if it, mercury poisoning and so on. And in these instances, it's not about progressive realization at all. It's about a, 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 a duty place placed immediately on the state to ensure that persons' health and lives are protected. So in, in, in similar to what my colleague was saying, um, I would have liked to hear more about this issue um, because, yes, it would seem that there are general health clinics and so on in the area, but one has the state even acknowledged that there's a threat based on mercury. Has that been acknowledged? And if it has been acknowledged, is there a specific program, quite apart from general health clinics and so on? That, I think, would go some way to satisfying or reassuring the Commission that there are not direct threats to health in the manner in which we speak in terms of a human rights uh, sort of um, issue. And the other um, sort of chunk that I would want to look at um, would be, and, and again, I'm endorsing all of the recommendations from that visit from last year, and I'm not going to go into them because we have documented them. But the other issue that I wanted to mention, which I find very interesting, which was just mentioned briefly here today by the petitioners and also yesterday in a working meeting, and that has to do what um, really perhaps what I might want to call inherent tensions, a clash of... Um, 
differing philosophies, if you like, about developmental goals. And I noted the agenda of the IDB um, in relation to gold mining. I think that it has to be of spe special significance to the commission at this point, uh, because it's, we are accustomed to talk about extractive industries, but it's not only about ex extractive industries, it's about a, a developmental agenda. And it's producing real conflicts um, I have seen, for example, from my other head, labor rights in general, where World Bank, IMF, and so on, that came out with the pure market model, has had to pull back and say that um, you must have human rights, a human rights dimension. There must be a human face um, to development and all of these things. And I think that's where we are reaching in relation to indigenous rights, and in particular here, because I heard the state say, well, you know, we are interested in, in development for everyone, and that is fine in equality, but I, I think it sort of misses the point if it is that indigenous peoples do not share that developmental vision. So for me, that is the point. So it's, it's a state may be well-intentioned, but um, does that vision of development, that philosophy of development, is, is that what indigenous peoples want? And the only way we could know that is if we have had genuine consultation. So we get back to the rights that indigenous peoples have in relation to consultation. And I would want to ask specifics about consultation. Um, what kind of consultation took place? How many people were consulted? I think we need some specifics. Um, it, 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 where were these persons consulted? And so on and so on. So, so to know that uh, the peoples of Apatina are indeed part of um, this development, because at the end of the day, these are not rights, um, indigenous rights are not negotiable anymore, I don't think. Uh, international human rights law has already secured uh, special rights indigenous peoples, so it's not a question of, of negotiating them. They have the right to live and to enjoy their cultural heritage and dignity, uh, their sacred traditions and the environment and so on. And so um, I think those are my concerns concerns apart from the sort of more tangible things that the recommendations were made in the ILO. These perhaps broader issues, abstract issues, I'm very much interested in. Commissioner Cavallaro. Uh, uh, thank you, Ms. Madam President. Uh, I will see my time. Uh, we're already beyond the time that we have, and I really would like to hear the reaction of the petitioners and particularly the state to the specific questions posed. Thank you very much. Um, petitioners? Let me begin by talking about no contact people. <clears throat> that is a term that um, is a bit ambiguous in that um, I want to just describe the life way of the Wayana people in general. They may, pre they may reside in the large village of Apatina, but they um, uh, engage in um, agriculture uh, and also in hunting and fishing that requires them to travel far afield so they don't reside there all the time. And there are many people, indigenous peoples, who live in the forest uh, that aren't necessarily taken into account in the census because when you go and count then you're looking at the people in the village and there are people who may have some family there, they reside there part of the time but they are traveling around the interior and part of the challenge with the Suriname Land Management Project is that the idea is okay well here's the village and so that's it. Everything else, we'll open that up for land privatization, but indigenous people don't live in the village, they live in the forest. And so that's why we felt we had to include uh, these people that we uh, described as no contact people, although they of course are in and participating in Anna Paiga, Apatina and so on. They're not necessarily living there all the time, so we have to consider the, the forest uh, far outside the boundaries of the official demarcated village itself. I also want to, um, <clears throat> talk a little bit about, um, uh, I, I do want to respond to the question of why no one is here from Apatina. It's a very good question. It's my sincere desire that someone from Apatina would be here. In fact, we've been asked to represent them, um, and I have a couple of reasons for that. Um, in my, the, I went to consult with them in September of last year. That was my last opportunity to go to Suriname, <clears throat> and I was informed by in-country partners that I work with, I have worked with continuously for several years that um, as I was driving to the airport of Suriname that um, they had been advised by individuals 
uh, to remove people from our team that were going to Apatina and, and put new people in the team, and including the removal would be um, all the people in my in-country team, including my translator, and those people would be replaced by this other team. And, the, and that other team were not uh, government officials, and uh, the person uh, who had inserted himself into my team had threatened my partner and uh, in-country partner and said that uh, there would be re reprisals, that she must not tell me what was going on, and, and it's all very ambiguous what would happen if she did share with me what was going on. So I chose not to go on that trip in September. And um, this person, um, who is a non, who is apparently not in the Suriname government, is the one who just sent us a threatening email after having refuted our uh, request to the commission. So my question is, if this person is not part of the government, how would they have reviewed the request? That's ambiguous to me. It's not a public document. It's a document that we submitted to the commission and the commission submitted to the state. So how would this person then have access to that? request. I don't know, and I'm not sure that these people here know either. I have no idea, but I am happy to submit that email to you. And of course, it's an email, so it's dated and timed and so on. Um, so I would be happy to do that. I also want to respond to this idea of um, uh, land rights, specifically. And uh, this will be my final comment that the Wayana have asked for a presentation before the commission because endless meetings on behalf of the state have led to no tangible progress or change. So we have discussed um, this uh, process of the government to try and consult indigenous peoples. I've also um, been told by leaders in Apatina that they've been invited to meetings on, uh, on issues related to land rights where there was no adequate um, translation at all. So the meetings are conducted in Dutch and the Wayana speak only Wayana. So to me, that is not adequate and genuine in consultation at all. And uh, they have also been asked to sign documents um, after having been consulted in Dutch. And so um, that to me is not a genuine consultation. So I again urge the commission to consider um, our uh, provision to, um, our uh, provision, um, our precautionary measure requesting intervention to protect our rights to defend the rights of the Wayana. Thank you. Um, Ambassador, could I invite the state to respond? Thanks. Um, thank you, President. Um, there are a number of issues for which um, a response um, is required. I'm not sure whether on all those elements we can respond at this moment of time. Um, I will ask um, the team of Suriname to respond to specific uh, questions, but as the official representative of the state, I would um, like to indicate that um, I think we should be careful. We are here for a hearing, and we are equal partners in this setting, and I think uh, we should be very careful when we utter allegations, and especially allegations of such a serious nature, and to point that the state might have any role in it. Um, I would like to categorically deny that the state has anything to do with influencing the mission of the Suriname Health Fund. But um, at the same time, we would like to invite her to submit the necessary uh, documentation to us. And I can assure you that uh, I will request my government to look into the matter and conduct a serious investigation as to what has happened on this uh, specific uh, occasion and how it, come, how, how it came to the fact that she was not even able or felt threatened to, to travel to the, to the hinterland for her, her mission. But I can assure you that my country is very safe and we provide everybody um, within the, uh, who acts within the con con constellation of rule and order in our country to move freely into uh, the territory of my country. Um, with respect to um, the issue of um, the land management uh, project of the um, um, IDB and how um, the land tenure system and the consultations have taken place on that matter. Um, I am not so sure whether I uh, will be able to answer all aspects of it, but I would certainly ask the district commissioner of uh, 
the area where the Tapanahoni resides to respond to some of the elements. And that would basically be on the element of how um, traditional authority is being um, um, conducted in that area and what how the element of consultation has been taking place in that specific um, um, uh, village. So with that, I would like to ask uh, District Commissioner Malonti. Mm -hmm. Bedankt, with the, uh, Ambassador. My apologies, Ambassador. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't mean to interrupt you. We have probably a minute or two to go okay. um, with another hearing behind us. So we actually pr are probably going to, we are absolutely welcoming you sending us additional information. Yes. Um, with the knowledge that we simply don't have enough time to hear you fully, but we but we understand the importance of much of the information you'd like to share with us. Um, excuse me. Can I ask you uh, how 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 much time do we still have? Because there are a couple of issues you want us to respond, and that is. Mm -hmm. Um, first of all, um, the element of consultation. If you want, we can uh, provide answer on that one at a later stage. But we would certainly like to respond to the element of um, the concerns of uh, the effect of mercury poisoning. Since we have the human toxicologist here, I would certainly like to give him the opportunity to respond on that question. Um, and if we can agree that on the element of um, um, which specific program, well, the element of which specific programs the state has on uh, mercury, I think the human toxicologist can answer on that one as well. Um, on the element of uh, FPIC, we can provide you answers on a later stage. And, um, well. We, Ambassador, we would, we would we'd welcome a brief intervention from the tox, toxicologist, maybe a minute or so. Our next hearing starts at 4.30, which is already already 4.30. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. I will just briefly state that since this was mentioned in the period of 2008-2010, uh, we as a government, we didn't stand still. We have been working on some structural approaches to, uh, to deal with the issue of mercury, the potential issue of the health effects and threats of mercury. So we have invested over time in uh, laboratory capacity and with collaboration of the PAHO and with collaboration of the Brazilian government, the Infante Chacas Institute, a well-known institute in, when it comes to mercury poisoning, to assist us in setting up a biological monitoring program. So at least we're getting clear, clear data and we can more specifically address the concerns that are in the communities. And we are now in the stadium of, in the, the state of, of executing a monitoring program and going into the field. So, so far, it's what I can state and always on the letter we can be more specific. Thank you very much, um, both to the petitioners and the state. Um, Ambassador, 20 seconds. Yes. Um, just um, to make sure that when we are submitting our written response that we understand what the petitioners understand on their censorship, because they indicated um, the element of censorship. Can they clarify what what they understood, because then we can uh, respond sure. to it. They, they can respond in writing, and I've also raised the question. Thanks, everyone. We're resuming.